Hello everyone, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel, Truth First Christianity in a Post-Christian Country. We separate the objective and factual about the Christian faith from the subjective and traditional for the benefit of our faith walks. Today I'm continuing to study the Code of Hammurabi, and as I read, break up the sections into videos for you. Today I'm going to offer the first two available codes in Hammurabi's law and compare them to what is written in Scripture. You'll probably see videos like this in the future in addition to others, but I want to jump right in and get started. So let's take a look at laws number one and two. In Hammurabi's code, uh, first of all, it predates the life of Moses by about a thousand years. Uh, and the code of Hammurabi offers about 250 moral and civil laws. Uh, between 30 and 35 are missing. Uh, and they have not yet been discovered or deciphered, and that often happens in books of antiquity, particularly the front portions and the back portions where they're most susceptible to rot and damage. While the Bible owes nothing to this document, it is clear that much of the early parts of Scripture are at least derived in part from Hammurabi's code. So let's take a look at what it says. The first of Hammurabi's laws, which I find interesting, starts out with references to the supernatural. If a man makes a false accusation against a man putting a ban upon him and cannot prove it, then the accuser shall be put to death. Interestingly, the first clause is directly translated, if a man weave a spell against another. Does this point to the idea of God or angels that walked among us? The Bible did indicate the crossbreeding and genetic tampering between angels and humans. This is interesting on many levels. Firstly, the false accusation is defined as a spell. We could overlook this as an issue of etymology, the evolution of words. Yet the next law and the several after it state, Thou shalt suffer not a sorceress to live. The next line goes on to say, A man or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. So what were people doing during this time? What were they seeing that we don't see today? Can it be argued that back at that time, closer to the source of God's direct creation and interaction with man, there was still more supernatural in the daily lives of people versus today where generation after generation after generation has either forgotten or gotten further away from God? Who were they living with back then? The very civilized and secular, albeit brutal, nature of the laws themselves don't allow us to suggest that they were just superstitious and didn't know better, as is a common excuse used today when viewing ancient mythology. This reveals that in early Babylon there was magic and sorcery being practiced openly and against the desire of the culture of some. The second law in Hammurabi's code that is available, and again, remember, there's about 30 missing before this, so when we say number one, we might actually mean number 36, 37. It says, if a man charge a man of being a sorcerer and is unable to sustain such a charge, the one who is accused shall go to the river, he shall plunge himself in the river, and if he sink into the river... His accuser shall take the house. If, however, the river show forth the innocence of this man, and he escape unhurt, then he who accused him of sorcery shall be put to death, while he who plunged into the river shall appropriate the house of the accuser. It is hard not to think and consider the prevalence of baptism in Christianity. There are two things, one being baptism. One is dipped into the water and coming out aligned, pure with Jesus Christ, regardless of different doctrinal beliefs 
uh, whether one can be washed and forgiven of sin or whether it's just an ordinance. The potential connection would certainly be interesting to explore. Um, one can find a potential connection to the Old Testament law in reference to the book of Numbers, the waters of jealousy is what it says there. Given that the ritual of the ordeal, and this is the second piece, the ordeal, right, the trial, think of witch trials in more modern times. If you're dipped in the water and you don't drown, you're not a witch. These tests uh, were practiced even back then and in the Bible, on cases of women charged with infidelity. Um, we see it in ceremonial drinking of water as a form of the ordeal in the Bible. And in the book of Psalms, there's also reference to a well of judgment. So right off the bat, we have references to the idea of the ordeal. We have references to the supernatural. These are an interesting uh, premise and I'm sure as we go further into the Code of Hammurabi, we're going to see many more interesting things like this. If you liked this video, please share it, like, subscribe, keep the discussion going in the comments, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks.